several times over the past few weeks, I've taken the opportunity to preach about some of the saints that have come up, either because they've presented themselves in the calendar or they were a secondary saint in the calendar, but their message was important, like going back to the beginning of August, we spoke about St. Stephen, the martyr, and the many things that surrounded his life, or then also later on, St. Lawrence, and the value and glory that there is in martyrdom and spiritual martyrdom. And once again, the church brings before us another opportunity to set aside the usual Sunday epistle and gospel to come to reflect upon other things here. In this particular case, the life of an apostle, St. Bartholomew, maybe not one of the better known of the apostles, the ones who were better invoked, yet still one who had gone forth and done much for God and suffered for Christ and for the gospel by being put to death. One of the things we do know that Bartholomew is one of the first of the apostles that were called. If you look at the order of the calling of the various ones that in the gospel story of today, this is the order that St. Luke presents to us in which these men were called to be apostles. The only difference is Peter is named first. Andrew was the first one who was called. St. John the Baptist had told his disciples, Andrew was one of them, he said to them that it was time for him to decrease and for him, pointing to Jesus, for him to increase. And he told his disciples that, behold the Lamb of God, follow him, follow his teachings and ways. And Andrew did right away. Andrew went and told Peter. But Peter is named first in the list because he's Peter. He's been set apart as the head of the church. And so out of respect for that. So apart from that little bit of a quirk right there at the beginning, this is the order in which they were called as apostles. Andrew and Peter, and then James and John, both brothers, who were called by the, sea, the, the, shore, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And then Philip was called, and then Philip went and found Bartholomew and had him come to see Christ. And it's, a, it's an interesting story, you know, in the, in the Gospels. I think it's in St. John's Gospel right away in the beginning that tells us how Bartholomew, he's called Nathaniel in um, the Gospel stories, to see how Bartholomew was called to be an apostle, to, to how Christ had called him, and to see a high praise that Jesus puts upon him because of his way of life, even though this is the first time physically they have met. Jesus as God has known this man and knows the virtue that he has. St. John records it this way. He says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was a city that did not have a good reputation, not good reputation for morals or many other things that were there. And so this is why many cases, and not only Nathanael had said this, but even some of the enemies of Jesus had used it over the years. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Is it possible for something good, this Messiah, to have come from Nazareth? Would God have allowed that to have happened? All Philip's answer was for him to say, rather than get into a big debate about it, he said, come and see. And Nathanael, to his credit, did. He's walked toward Jesus, and as he was coming closer to Jesus, our Lord spoke up, and he said, Behold an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no guile. Now, guile, you know, guile is that particular point, or it's a, a bad habit. Let's call it hypocrisy. We pretend ourselves to be what we are not. We push ourselves off on people as good or this particular way. We try to fool God. We try to fool our fellow men. Maybe we even tried to fool ourselves. That's what guile is, hypocrisy. Jesus gave high praise to Bartholomew, a man who, in which there is no guile. This man was truly, as you saw him, that is how he presented himself. The things he spoke of, the way he acted. It was always the same on every, every individual, more than likely because he fully understood by the spirit of faith about God and the presence of God among each individual. And that struck Nathanael to be called by that kind of work of praise. And Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know me? When did that come about? When did we meet? And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip even came to you and told you about me, I saw you sitting under the tree. And he goes, how could you do that? The only way you could do that is if you were God and saw me as God sitting under the tree. And this is what Nathaniel says. He says, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, thou believest. Greater things than these shalt thou see. And then again he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, 
you shall see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Perhaps because of his lack of guile, that his honesty of spirit, St. Bartholomew was going to be made known to him more about the spiritual truths and wonderful revelations about the gospel, at least in a spirit of prayer and conduct that he would have. It seemed that he would have that kind of a reward. At least that's what it appears to be at this point. But that's all we know. This is all that we hear of in the gospel story. The only other time we ever meet with Bartholomew by name is in one of the other gospels where he is mentioned, like in the gospel of St. Luke that we read from here today. His name is mentioned as one of those who followed Jesus. And so here's how we know. This is how we come to understand who Bartholomew is. Tradition is what tells us more about his way of life. Tradition tells us that he went to preach, he was sent to preach um, in the area of the world that we'll call Afghanistan and Pakistan today. That's where he went to preach, and he preached the gospel there. Afterwards, he was sent to Armenia, the part in, in near the parts of the Russia area that we know of in our geography for today. It was there while he was preaching in Armenia that he converted the king and the queen and that household, his family and the whole household, um, to the gospel, to Christianity, baptized them all. There are other people, pagans um, in, in their practice, who were so offended by this that they uh, seized Bartholomew and were ready to put him to death. And the manner in which he was put to death um, was quite cruel. I mean, think anything of the martyrs that have gone through is quite cruel, but St. Bartholomew, you know, it's not something you would automatically think of to flay somebody alive, to strip their skin from them while they are still living. But that was the cruelty he underdid. And tradition tells us he did it with such a sweetness of countenance, sweetness of disposition, that it encouraged people, encouraged others to become Christian. If this man can suffer in this way, then there must be something to what it is that he preaches. And so the gospel continued to live on more and more, even though he was dead and was not preaching anymore. The good example he had lived so filled the people that Christianity started to spread even after his death. In reviewing the life of St. Bartholomew like this, and like I said, what little we do know of his life, and it's trying to put together what it is that we could, an additional point that we can draw from that. We've already reflected upon martyrs. We've already reflected upon the martyrdom and suffering and things of that nature with the two saints earlier this month. But there's something else when we speak about the lives of the apostles, the things that they have suffered, but the work that they have done that led me to want to bring up today a subject that isn't often brought up, but still needs to be reviewed a bit. And it, it, it ties in with the work of the apostles going forth and the missionaries after them, after the example apostles, where they would go forth into the, the world to preach the gospel to every creature as they were commanded to do so by Jesus. The successfulness of the work that they would do would all depend on how they interacted, to use our language of today, how they interacted with those whom they were around. They may not have known the language, but the Holy Ghost took care of that to the point they could speak there and the people would understand them. They would have to adapt themselves and understand customs and take anything that would be pagan away from them and help them to live a better and good life. By their good example, they would lead people along. They would show themselves true people concerned for the souls of these individuals as missionaries going out. The apostles themselves, like I said, missionaries later, and so because of all that, we see the gospel being preached and people coming to the faith. It led me to you know, think about, like I said, a subject that we don't often um, speak about enough, but we should, at least as a point of reflection for us. And it's how you and I act in our social relations with one another. We know from baptism that you and I are called to be apostles, if you will. We're here not only to save our own souls, but by good example and by prayer for others to help them to save theirs. That's a responsibility each one of us shares. We can't just move it aside. We also know that it was the plan of God from the beginning that all creatures that God had made, and when, remember when we read the book of Genesis and where God, after this, the works of creation, after he has finished all the works of creation, he said they were all good. God's plan was that in all these creatures that man would use them to be able to look back toward God, to lift them up toward God, who is the author of life, the author of all creation. 
The trouble is that after the fall of Adam and Eve and the corruption that came as a result of original sin, the weakness of soul that came with that, and then every personal sin everyone has ever committed, the additional weakness that comes on top of that, then the use of creatures can actually be something that is abused. And instead of lifting someone up toward God, can actually take them away from him. It can be a tendency that's so great within us that we've got to step back, if we will, by prayer and understand and say, this is something I've got to be careful of. This is something I have to look at and say, everything that I do or all all the things I associate with should help to lead me up toward God, not pull me away. It's on that basis that we understand the words that come to us from the Holy Ghost in the book of um, wisdom in the Old Testament. Speaking of friendship, the friendships that we have with one another, the friendships that we make. The Holy Ghost says about a friendship, a friend is a wise counselor. This is going to be the mark of a true friend. You know, we always talk about friend, true friend, somebody who likes me, laughs at my jokes, goes along with me here. My friend may have a little few quirks here and there and may kind of push an envelope at this particular point, but it's still my friend. Well, no, we understand, first of all, the basis of friendship is not on how somebody, how funny they are. If they push an envelope, and gosh, you know, I think they're so bold, maybe I'd like to be around them because I'm not bold enough in my life. Or maybe it's because this this person looks nice or has so many other friends here that I want to be able to get along with all those friends. We start to put that as our measure of how we will look for friends and set up friends in our life, whether it's at work or at school, in neighbors, or even among our own family. Dealing with this particular point about friendship. We look at all those other circumstances of how I'm going to be based on a friend and looking for a friend and establishing somebody and calling him a friend, especially someone who is a best friend. If it's all based on that, it's all purely natural. And that person, instead of lifting me up like good friends will do, can actually tear me down and lead me away. This is why the Holy Ghost says, not only is my friend a wise counselor, if I should be having doubts, if I should be going through a bad time, I pray to God I have such a good friend who will say something to me. Because he is my friend, she is my friend, who wants to see the better thing for me, the best thing for me, as I will save my soul. And if I'm out wandering and doing things, falling into temptation, I would hope and pray that my friend would step in and say, because I am your friend, I am telling you these things, and I am praying for you and helping you. That's, these are the type of friends we have to make, not the other things there that take us down, the ones that build us up, especially in times when we're weak on our own. The Holy Ghost says of the friend, too, that the, that the friend is a strength to us. If we have a good friend, that friend will be a strength to us in tough times. Times when we might be thinking of yield to temptation. If I've got a good friend, friend who I know who is strong in virtue, who lives a good life, who has the same goals in mind that I do, well then, I need that strength to lean on when I'm weak. Or maybe that other person who is calling me friend needs that help too. And so I have to be strong for my friend, not weak and say, oh, go ahead, you know, it's your life. I, I'm, I'm not judge of you. I can't do all these things for you. It's not here. It's your free will. Do whatever you want. That's really not the way it works. Remember the story in Genesis of Cain and Abel? Abel is the one who gave great sacrifices, the proper sacrifices to God, and Cain was the one who gave sec- you know, uh, secondary fruits. He gave a sacrifice to God, but it was not of his best. God was pleased with Abel's sacrifices. He was displeased with Cain's. Cain's became so envious and jealous that he killed his brother Abel. When God came looking for Abel, because his blood, it says, cried out to heaven for vengeance, as it happens with all murders. When God came looking for Abel, he spoke to Cain, and he says, where is your brother Abel? <laughs> what does Abel, uh, Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? I'm not my brother. You know, it's, it's his life. He can go out and live what he wants. 
To some degree, that might be true. But in many other areas, if I can see that my brother, my friend, is starting to slip, God has put me in that person's path there right now to be able to help them. In that sense, I am my brother's keeper. In, my sen in that sense, I am one there who is to help my friend to stay on the proper path because that's what friends do. Friends are not just there to take people out. You know, let's go out here and party here. Let's go out to this movie. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. All natural basis is a friendship. It needs to be based on the supernatural. This is what baptism brings us to. This is what we understand of what Christ does to us. And when we look at that, when we supernaturalize our time with others in this way and make a friendship what it should be, something that is uplifting, not tearing down, not having a friend who takes us away, in that sense, that person is no friend. He does not bring us strength, does not give us a wise counselor. Again, in the Book of Wisdom, speaking about friendship, it says, that for those who have such a friend, who is a strength to them, who is a wise counselor to them, he says, we have found a treasure beyond measure on this earth. A treasure beyond measure to have a good friend. Maybe that will help us to understand why we've got to be careful in making friends. We can't just have this desperate idea about us. I need to have a friend. I've got to have one. I'll settle for anyone out there, especially for young people. In particular, always concerned this particular point with them of how all of a sudden it just seems to be I have to have a friend, so I'll settle for anybody. If somebody looks kindly on me, fine. If I get along with a crowd, even though it's a bad crowd, still they're all friends. They're talking to me. Nobody else is talking to me. I can be around bad people here. I'll call them friends. Call them something else. They're not friends for your soul. They're not friends for your good welfare. They're leading you down, and you're letting them do it. That's the problem that comes up with this. I remember when I was growing up in high school, I had a friend, there we go, you know, first before I fully understood the definitions of friend, someone I knew from school. Hang around with him. My mom and dad knew him. At one point, my mother, just being my mother, just said, I'm going to pray him off you. <laughs> like, oh gosh. You know, here I thought a friend, you know, God, and I'm going to, she's going to pray him off me. Well, he did. It was gone. After we graduated from school, later on found out this man, he registered for the Communist Party and became very active in the Communist Party. Had I continued to work with him as a friend to the level it was going, I probably wouldn't be here today. But I had a mother who was a friend to my soul and who prayed him off. I didn't like it at the time. Now I appreciate it. It's because when we're young and foolish, we're looking for anybody to call a friend, anybody who smiles at us, anybody who does some things there, especially people who will push the envelope. We think, gosh, that, that's a great person to talk because everybody likes them. Nobody likes a person who is good all the time. People stay away from them. Yeah, but if we're friends with God, what does it matter what the people of the world think? Oh, it matters a lot to young people. Sure it does. It matters a lot if we don't have many friends in the world and people ridicule us maybe because we are attempting to be good. But they are no friends to our souls. They are trying to entice us over to a different way of life. And they're wrong in that way. Friendship. Friendship is something that is so important for us to understand, and the basis for which it is, the basis of it is in God, who is my strength, who is my counselor, my guide. And having such a friend, it is better than any treasure, a treasure above measure. And gosh, if we have one, two, three, four such friends, how full, how rich our lives will be because we have that basis of true friendship guiding our life. I know that's not, like I said, the way society looks at it today. I know in trying to establish friendships and living as friendships, 
in this way is different according to society standards and would be looked upon as somebody who is standard, whether at work or at school, among neighbors, especially among family. Family was supposed to be the best of friends. How oftentimes in families we seem to be the worst of enemies, arguing and yelling and screaming and doing all this kind of stuff. It's too bad. We haven't understood the value, the merit, the point of what friendship is. Maybe what, this is what we'll do with St. Bartholomew today, a, th a thought we can have. St. Bartholomew went out to win souls for Christ. He was friends to their souls. And those who understood it came along and followed the gospel because of his words and his example, his encouragement, his guidance, his strength. Those who didn't want to understand it sought to kill him and actually succeeded in doing it, but did not succeed in accomplishing or, or stopping the mission that he had to bring souls to Christ. Why don't we pray to St. Bartholomew today to understand this value, this merit, and friendship? If anybody here is in bad friendships right now, get out of them. That friend is doing no good for your soul, and the longer you stay in with it, you're playing with fire. Find true friends. Don't just say, well, if I leave this person, leave that person, what, Father, I'm going to have no friends. You know, St. Raphael led the young Tobias to his wife because he did the things of God. Over the course of the centuries, we see in the lives of the saints and of others, all the good people, we do the right things for God. God leads us to the proper people who will be true friends for us. If we would have a spirit of faith about us, especially in this area of friendship, we wouldn't worry that we have to settle for something that's far less, not a good counselor, not a good guide for me. This person really isn't a treasure, but at least he's a friend. Ah, sorry. Not a good way. We don't compromise like that in our Christian way of life. That's not the proper way. And if we don't fully understand that, like I say, let's pray to St. Bartholomew of today. He went forth to bring the gospel to people. He was a true friend there. He had true friends among him in his fellow apostles and laborers, all for Christ, who assisted one another, strength to one another, guide and counselors for one another. What great lessons that come to us here. St. Bartholomew was a man without guile, without hypocrisy. Maybe that's what attracted people to him in friendship because virtue always attracts people in that way. Maybe that's what it was. Whatever it could be, let's pray to St. Bartholomew today. Ask for his help and guidance, and surely it will be there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.